Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. We're very excited to have such a large crowd for this webinar and uh, hopefully for the other two webinars in this series. My name is Bill McKelvey. I'm a project coordinator with the Interdisciplinary Center for Food Security at the University of Missouri. We are kicking off our webinar series today. Uh, the overall theme is understanding and addressing inequalities in the food system. We have Dr. Sarah Kramer as our speaker today. She's the visiting assistant professor of sustainable food systems from Stetson University in DeLand, Florida. I do want to take just a moment to introduce our event sponsors. Mary Hendrickson, would you like to introduce the Center for Food Security? Sure. Hi, and welcome, everyone. I am co-director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Food Security here at the University of Missouri. And really what our center does is research, teaching, and outreach at the intersection of food security and food systems. Uh, our signature programs include the Missouri Hunger Atlas, which you can find on our website. Um, also, Power Up Your Pantry, which is creating capacity for food pantry directors here in Missouri. Grow Well Missouri, which is helping food pantry clients grow their own food. Those are just some of the programs that we do here at the Interdisciplinary Center. The event is also sponsored by our MU Extension community and economic development food systems team. So this is a group of community and economic development specialists around the state who work together, uh, meet on a monthly basis, and really work on a variety of projects that are really kind of combining community development and food systems work. So one of our main projects is Missouri Eats. That's a community engagement an education program where we're focused on working with communities around the state to build healthy, resilient, and equitable food systems. So I just wanted to let you know, as Bill said, we this is the first of several webinars we've organized for this fall. So we're taking a big picture approach today on just thinking about inequalities. The second webinar will be addressing food system inequalities in rural areas. And that will be presented by Margaret Crome Lukens, who is with RAFI International in um, Pittsburgh, North Carolina. And she will be focusing on some of the work that this nonprofit has been doing in rural areas around um, uh, food system inequalities. Our third webinar will come back here to Missouri uh, and will feature Erica Williams from uh, a red circle in St. Louis, Missouri. And she will be talking about some of the projects and programs and ideas that they have for addressing um, food system inequalities in St. Louis. And as always, more information can be found at foodsecurity.missouri.edu. In terms of the format for today, we're going to hear from our speaker, Sarah Kramer, for about 30 minutes. During that time, everybody's mics will be muted. Um, because of the large number of participants, we decided that that was probably a good practice. We will have a quest question and answer period for about 20 minutes. At that time, if you would like to be unmuted, you can either raise your hand uh, using the Zoom feature found down through the little participants tab, and we'll call on you and unmute your mic and you can ask your question, no problem. You could also put questions into the chat feature and we will, we have a few people who are serving as co-hosts. We'll be monitoring that chat and ask questions at that time. Um, and then we're gonna try something a little bit new. So normally we hold these seminars on the campus of the University of Missouri in Gwynn Lounge. Um, and we typically have a social period after the presentation and after the seminar. So we're going to follow that format. So if people want to hang around uh, really between the 4.45 and 5.30 p.m. CST time period, this is really just an informal opportunity to have some conversation, to get to know folks. There's really no agenda. Uh, so please feel free to hang around for that and we will have a conversation. So with that, 
I will turn it over to Dr. Sarah Kramer and let her proceed with the presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be kicking off this webinar series. Uh, like Bill and Mary said, today we're taking a very, very big picture view um, and kind of zooming out to think about inequalities as a whole. Um, so unfortunately, I am not the one providing many answers to these questions or challenges in our society and in our food system, um, but that's the purpose of webinar two and three. So today we just kind of introduce the problem um, and then two and three will continue to investigate solutions. So kind of an overview for the next 25, 30 minutes, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself um, and kind of how I come at this question of inequality in the food system. And then we're going to go through some definitions. Um, what is inequality? Uh, what different types of inequalities shape our social structures? And then how do these structural inequalities shape our food system? Um, and because this is such a massive, massive topic, I thought that it would be useful to think about inequalities in three specific contexts. So I'm going to present a little bit of information about how inequalities shape agricultural production, um, then a little bit about inequalities and consumers, so on the other end of the food system. And then finally, a little bit of information about how we have seen um, widening inequalities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I also just kind of want to frame this conversation um, as much more of an invitation to think about these things than a a lecture kind of information dump um, because there is just so much to talk about here. It, it's truly impossible for us to, to really present all of the information in a 30 minute webinar, in, in a week long webinar. Um, there's just so much to say. And so I want you to think about this as an invitation to look at places where we see these kind of forces play out in your own life and in your own work. Um, when Bill first proposed this topic, I, I was kind of overwhelmed at the scale of the problem, um, but I've, I've come to think of that really as an opportunity because when we're talking about systemic and structural issues, uh, that means that they are literally everywhere. So we can zoom in anywhere in our society and see these issues play out. And so while that makes it really hard to give the complete picture in a webinar, that also means that you can find uh, the things that we'll be talking about today truly anywhere. Um, and so that, that is also an opportunity for further investigation. So like Bill said, I just wanted to reiterate, um, you're welcome to put questions in the chat that we will address then during the Q&A. So uh, Bill, Mary, and I will all be facilitating discussion at the end. Um, and then also I have incorporated a number of reflection prompts throughout the webinar uh, that again play into this invitation to really think about how uh, these forces shape your lives and your work. So um, you don't need to respond to those in the chat. Uh, you can perhaps bring them up during our informal discussion time at the end or just think about them and reflect on them um, moving forward. So who am I? Uh, my name, again, Sarah Kramer. I am starting my third year at Stetson University in DeLand, Florida. Um, I graduated from the University of Missouri with a PhD in 2018. And then I also got my public health degree from Mizzou in 2013. Um, some specific areas that I research and teach about, alternative food systems, um, specifically race, class, and gender in the food system. So there is a course that I teach at Stetson that actually I co-developed with Mary um, when I was in graduate school at Mizzou, um, all on race, class, and gender in the food system. So that course has continued to be offered at MU, I offer it at Stetson, um, and a lot of this webinar content is really that class condensed into 30 minutes. So uh, the material that we'll be going over, I can provide a lot of follow-up content, um, either via email or I have some links that I'm gonna drop in the chat at the end for additional articles that really help flesh out this conversation um, because we'll be moving so quickly. Um, also, I wanna highlight another thing that I'm involved in, which is Stetson's Higher Education in Prison Project. So I taught a credit-bearing course at the prison in food studies um, two summers ago, and I continue to work with incarcerated students at uh, Tomoka Correctional Institution, which is a 
prison in Daytona Beach, about 20 minutes down the road from here. Um, and I work with incarcerated students to conduct research on prison foodways. Um, we're working on establishing a community garden in the prison. Of course, all of that has been completely halted due to the pandemic because prisons are the epicenters of most states' outbreaks. Um, but I wanted to put this in here because we see structural inequality everywhere. Um, we see it in prison. We know that most people who are in prison are poor and there's even the same sorts of structures and class hierarchies in that context. And so that work has really given me a new perspective on the questions of structural inequalities and structural inequities um, in the world and in the food system. And then finally, before I got my PhD, I worked for several years in garden-based learning at a, a school gardening nonprofit. And one of those years was as an AmeriCorps volunteer. Um, and because of the income that you make as an AmeriCorps volunteer, you're SNAP eligible. So I did spend a year as a SNAP recipient, um, which has also, which are food stamps, um, which has also given me some empathy for that process and one of the ways that we try and address food insecurity. So anyway, that's a little bit about me. But now into the, the stuff that you're really here for. So how do we define inequality generally? So I wanted to put this definition, or this first definition in here um, to kind of frame our conversation. So we have social inequality, relational processes in a society that limit a certain group's power and limit or harm their class, social status, and or quality of life. So that is one way that we see inequality. Um, examples of social inequality play out in disparities in voting rights, um, access to quality education, housing, transportation, and healthcare. So this is one way that um, inequalities shape our social systems more generally. And then of course, a contributing factor of social inequality um, is economic inequality, but they are not necessarily the same thing. So this is where we see uh, disparities in the distribution of economic assets across groups of people um, caused by unequal accumulation of wealth. Um, also, wealth does not equal income. So this is something that I always want to reiterate with my students, that income, the amount of money that we make from our jobs, is one thing that contributes to our wealth, but wealth is all of your combined assets. So if you own land, if you own a home, if you have investments, all of those things are contributing to your wealth, but they're not necessarily related to your income directly. But also we see disparities in income as well. So this is happening on lots of different levels. Um, and of course these inequalities are stratified along race, class, gender, um, they, they can't happen separate from these social constructs and what we have decided it means to be a certain race or a certain class or a certain gender. I also wanted to put in uh, a little discussion about the difference between inequality and inequity. So this webinar series is all framed around inequalities, which are the unbalanced um, situations that we find ourselves in in society in terms of these disparate conditions. So the inequality is the lack of balance, um, but, but they are caused by inequities. And so inequities are how we assert that these unbalanced conditions did not just happen, that they were caused by um, unfair or unjust policies, conditions, decisions made by people in power. So I think this difference is really important to remember because otherwise it's really easy to, to come up with kind of um, outlandish or inappropriate explanations for inequalities in our society. So thinking that, um, you know, women just make less money because they just do, because it's just an inequality, that's very different from questioning um, all of the, the social forces and economic forces and cultural forces that have contributed to something like a, a wage gap. So inequalities and inequities, I'll use the terms sometimes interchangeably, um, but they do mean these importantly different things. Um, yeah, this is, this is again what I just highlighted. So inequalities can seem passive or inevitable, um, but inequities acknowledge that these conditions in our lives are caused uh, by active decision making. And I think that's also really empowering because those decisions can then be undone by new decisions. Um, okay, before I get into some of my specific case studies, uh, I wanted to include this figure. Um, and this is a figure that I include in a lot of my classes at the beginning of the semester 
to frame our conversations around um, disparities in our societies. So I'm just gonna pause for just a moment and just let everybody examine this chart. And the reflection prompts that I wanted you to think about um, as we look at this and perhaps that we can discuss at the end during the Q&A. Um, have you seen this chart before? So this comes from a Forbes magazine article um, and this data is now a little bit out of date uh, because it's from 2011. The article itself was updated in 2015. Um, but because of the way wealth is accumulated, we can comfortably argue that this gap has not gone anywhere in the last five years. Um, so have you seen this chart before? If you teach, do you ever teach about the wealth gap? If you're a food systems practitioner, how does the wealth gap shape your work? Um, and then also, what caused the wealth gap? So it's really hard to have these conversations about inequality um, without diving into the historical context that has brought us to where we are today. So again, thinking about the differences between inequity and inequality, um, it did not just happen that white families accumulated this amount of wealth um, and black families did not. And so when we think about the, the founding of our country, the history of land theft um, and slavery and the many centuries when certain families were earning wealth and building wealth and certain families were not, um, that that is how that's how we got here. And so we also see the more recent but still historical vestiges of this in things like redlining um, that prevented black families from being able to build wealth in the form of home ownership in certain neighborhoods. Um, also restrictive covenants that were not quite the same as redlining but still had a very similar effect. Um, so when you think about, again, the ways that we build wealth, owning land, owning a home, um, these, these are the ways. And so for hundreds of years, and even, you know, within the last century, there have been myriad policies that have ensured that certain families have been able to build wealth and other families have not. And so I really wanted to start with this chart. I really wanted to emphasize this chart. Um, because this sets the stage for so many of the inequalities that we are still dealing with today. So getting a little more narrow um, into our conversation about inequalities and the food system, I also wanted to put a note in here um, that it's important to remember that our food system is not separate from the rest of society. So the fact that I included the wealth gap that is referring to, you know, the general state of things for the United States, and that has nothing to do, according to the chart, with the food system. Um, of course, that's not how the food system operates in our lives. So it's integrated into our social, economic, cultural, and environmental systems. So things that are inequitable in the rest of our lives, housing, healthcare, education, um, those are all part of our experiences in the food system. So inequities in our society yield inequities in our food system. I also wanted to include this definition um, from Iowa State Extension. It, it was in a resource that um, I think Bill may be sharing with folks who have attended the webinar. Um, we've been collecting some additional reading and things to follow up with. So this is from a, a website that I've included here. Food inequity refers to the adverse effects of both the production and distribution of food that marginalized communities face. We currently have an inequitable food system that disproportionately burdens and denies access to communities of color and high poverty. In an equitable food system, race, class, geography, and other social identities would not be indicators for whether or not you have a voice in and access to a nourishing food system. So basically what this means is that because we know that all people don't have the same amount of power in the food system, uh, they don't shape decisions the same way, and they don't have the same access to either the ability to grow food as a farmer or the ability to buy high quality food as a consumer. Um, because we know those things are part of our, our situation, um, that's how we understand that the food system is inequitable. And so an equitable food system um, levels the playing field and ensures that there is the same amount of power across the board, no matter your race, class, geography, um, or other social identity. 
So my first case here, we're going to think a little bit about how inequalities shape production agriculture. Um, and, and I really like this framing with producers, consumers, and then of course, just the current events, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, because it's, it's so important to remember how all of these things are interconnected. So inequalities on the production end of things uh, shape the state of things on the consumption end. So some reflection prompts that I want you all to be thinking about uh, when I go through this next couple set of slides. What barriers keep marginalized people from becoming farmers? How does the wealth gap translate to production agriculture? Who is able to accumulate wealth in the realm of production agriculture and who is not? And then how do these inequities shape other elements of the food system? So I've included uh, some data here just to illustrate some of these points. So I'll move through these pretty quickly, but again, we can return to them in the discussion. <clears throat> but I also uh, just want to let you absorb each of these graphics that I've included. So this is uh, 2016 data from the USDA ERS, poverty rates by race, ethnicity, and metro, non-metro residents. So what this is telling us is that non-metro or rural residents across the board tend to be poorer than those in metro areas. Um, but then when we look at it by race, we also see specifically which categories of people are more poor. So we see rural or non-metro black or African-American individuals um, with the highest percent of the population being poor and then next, um, American Indian, Alaskan Native, um, Hispanic, and then we have white, and then white non-Hispanic. So just looking at these issues, um, when we're thinking about inequality, we cannot stop thinking about race, class, and gender, because those are the social forces that shape this inequality. And so the reason why I put this chart in here, not just to illustrate the breakdown by race, um, but also to remind us where most of our food is grown, right? So the, the economic status of folks in rural areas is inextricably connected to production agriculture because that's where most of our food is coming from. So when you extrapolate this data and you think about who has the wealth to buy a farm, who inherits farms, who inherits farm equipment, um, those sorts of trends are why we continue to see these inequities on the production end of things. Um, and then of course there are ripple effects for the rest of us because when we have a food system that is full of producers that don't represent the way the rest of society actually looks, um, we are again perpetuating an inequitable system. Um, so I also have this set of data that also just needs a little bit of time um, to soak in. But what I'm really trying to highlight here is how little income is often made from farms. Um, so not only is farming capital intensive to get into, but it's also not necessarily yielding a lot of income or allowing individuals to build wealth. So these these challenges are coming from multiple different directions. So again, I will stop talking for a moment um, and let, uh, allow this to sink in. So all of this is just kind of highlighting the fact that farming is expensive, right? Getting into farming as a new farmer is expensive. So that's why we see uh, most new farmers are operating at a very small scale. Um, sometimes they're urban farmers or living in an area that can directly sell to markets in um, urban regions. So the, the types of people that inherit farms are the people that continue to be farmers. Um, and so when we think about where the wealth in our country is housed and who owns the land in our country, again, this is all um, building to this same argument that production agriculture does not represent uh, the, the rest of society. And farming is expensive. So these are just two examples. We've got um, a chicken house or a combine 
it costs a lot of money to get into farming at this scale. So if you're going to be a commodity grower, or if you're going to get into large scale livestock production, um, you really have to have the capital to do that. So we're shifting now. Um, again, it's so much to cover that it's almost uh, laughable that we're doing it in 30 minutes, but thinking about this context from the production end of our food system um, and wondering how this might shape the consumption end. So our reflection prompts for you to think about as we move through these slides, um, in what ways is hunger in the US a symptom of structural inequalities? Again, these things didn't just happen by accident. Where do they come from? Um, how is food access connected to food production? And how might alternative food movements Farmers markets, buy local campaigns, organic agriculture, et cetera, perpetuate inequalities among consumers. So again, returning to this framing from the beginning of inequalities and inequities being structural, meaning we can see them everywhere. Um, we see them in conventional food systems and we see them in alternative food systems. So we have not yet solved this problem in any form in our current food system because the problems are structural and because they are everywhere. So this chart um, illustrates prevalence of food insecurity and very low food security trends over time. Um, and the main takeaway here is just this jump that we saw during the Great Recession. Um, when you look at projections, in the pandemic and when you when you look at folks like Feeding America who are trying to rapidly collect data on how food insecurity has been increased uh, due to the pandemic, the far edge of the chart just shows a number of lines continuing to go up. So we're still uh, not sure exactly what the long term change to these trends will be, um, but we know that it's not looking very good. So this is uh, one piece of the puzzle, but then of course, uh, like we did with income in metro and non-metro areas, oh, yeah, the, the defining feature of low food security. So I put this defin in here, definition in here just to clarify uh, the difference. So like we did with um, percent of people poor in metro and non-metro areas, I've also included this uh, data stratified by race to again illustrate that these that inequity can't exist without different groups of people um, being treated differently or experiencing the world differently. And so when we look at the jump in the Great Recession, we see which populations of people were most affected by that. Um, we see black, non-Hispanic, and then Hispanic populations experiencing much more food insecurity um, being at the top of the chart compared to the rest of the categories. So just a few examples of ways that we see structural inequalities play out at the point of consumption. Um, so we see it in the disruption of traditional and indigenous food ways. Um, when we think about the, the people who occupied all of our farmland uh, before European settlers arrived, that marks the beginning of this ongoing disruption in indigenous foodways that continues today. Um, we also see issues with food access and obesity interventions that perpetuate white constructions of food health and weight. So there, there is a lot of this kind of narrative that there's a certain way to eat, a certain way to be healthy. Um, there's a lot of stigmatization of different food ways. And, and so I would encourage us to shift away from that. Um, coming from a public health background, we, we were inundated with messaging about the obesity epidemic and using this kind of medical language to describe things like body difference. Um, and, and we know that the situation is much more complex than that. And so that really leads into my next bullet point here that I, I see a major issue in this stigmatization of food choices in a structurally inequitable food landscape. And so when we have um, obesity interventions or alternative food systems that are encouraging people to, you know, eat more produce or shop at the farmer's market or use their um, small amount of income on different, different food choices, we're ignoring the fact that 
the landscape is structurally inequitable. So we are not operating in the same um, landscape. We don't all have access to the same food choices. And so I think that ties into this um, construction of kind of a whitewashed perception of health and, and healthy eating. And then also um, the, the individual choice language certainly shifts the focus away from the structural problems, which are the problems. Um, and then we also have food apartheid. Uh, this is a term that a lot of scholars have shifted to um, and shifted away from the term food desert because the term food desert tends to be kind of problematic. Um, it also makes it sound like an area is devoid of resources um, and that's just not true. And, and the term desert also makes it sound like a naturally occurring process, right? So when we're thinking about, again, the difference between inequality and inequity, inequity if we assume that food deserts just happened, um, then it seems like there's nothing we can do about them because they are just naturally occurring. But food apartheid um, really refers to the active decision-making that caused certain neighborhoods to be food insecure, uh, to not have grocery stores, to not have access to green space or community gardens. So I, I like us to think about this um, intentional difference in, in language when we're talking about some of these issues. Um, and then I wanted to put a note in here, again, to highlight the fact that these issues are structural and systematic and they occur at all levels. Um, we saw this play out over the summer with Bon Appetit magazine. So I don't know if any of you follow Bon Appetit magazine as obsessively as I do, um, but they have a lot of video content right now and they've really shifted their brand to be online um, YouTube videos and very personality driven. But there was this huge scandal over the summer when it came out that the um, employees of color were not being paid for their work when the white employees were being paid for their content creation. And so we also see this with um, high profile white chefs appropriating food ways that maybe don't belong to them um, or they have not done the work to really investigate the origin of things like Southern food. Um, Rick Bayless is kind of a famous example with Mexican food. He's, he's white, um, he has no Mexican heritage. And so just really thinking critically about where we see these inequalities and really asking who is benefiting from these systems, who is making the money in each of these contexts. Um, and finally, like I said, I wanted to just include a brief little bit of information just to get us thinking about how these inequalities um, continue to play out in the COVID-19 pandemic, but then also how we might see opportunities for additional intervention um, because we are in a crisis and we are really in a moment where we could be shifting things in a new direction. Um, so there is a brief, there's about a four minute NPR piece, this how the COVID-19 pandemic is deepening economic inequality in the US. And it really gives a nice, concise overview um, about what, what we are seeing right now. But again, it's from August, um, things are changing very fast. Some of the information that I have on the next slide was from the spring and who even knows if if it is still relevant because we are, we are moving so fast. So instead of thinking specifically about the data, thinking about the processes and the trends that we're seeing. So reflection prompts here, just to think about before we wrap up, um, what structural economic issues existed before the pandemic that have been exacerbated by COVID-19? Um, a lot of scholars are encouraging us not to think about these issues as new, but to think about the uh, pandemic as highlighting issues that existed before. Um, and also what new challenges in the food system have emerged due to COVID-19. So again, just a really brief overview of some of what we're seeing. Um, so we have seen that agricultural production has remained relatively stable. Um, so that is one kind of constant in the pandemic. Early on, uh, I think we all remember the bare supermarket shelves. So there was a lot of fear that we would see food shortages um, and, and that maybe the supply chains wouldn't be able to keep up. So that has not continued to be the issue that we all feared it would in the beginning. Most retail supply chains have leveled out since spring. Um, but what we're still 
dealing with are some of the challenges of the inflexible supply chains that we have. So for example, if an entire school district shifts to virtual learning, um, what happens to all of those contracts that were supplying the milk for the cafeteria? Um, what happens to students who are receiving free and reduced lunch or, you know, here I'm in my office on Stetson's campus. Um, a number of our students are learning exclusively virtually. They're not even in DeLand. They might be somewhere else. Um, so the, the supply has been, has to be diverted um, to different places because the demand is not there the way that it was before. So those are some of the big questions that we're still kind of seeing how they play out. Um, another thing to take note of, a lot of people who were previously food insecure before the pandemic are in high risk categories for COVID-19. Um, so they might be older, they might be disabled, they might be black or uh, Latino. So groups that we are seeing being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Also food service workers in general are more likely to be food insecure, um, but also they are less likely to have things like paid sick leave and additional benefits, um, high quality insurance. So they are at risk of greater food insecurity when restaurants shut down, but also they don't have the ability to stay home from work like so many of us do. So these um, really wicked problems that we're seeing for folks that work in the food industry. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, overall household rates of food insecurity have doubled. So I think that's a really, really striking fact. Um, and then this last one, 34.5% of households with children 18 and under are food insecure, which is an increase of 130% compared to pre-pandemic rates. So when we are thinking about kind of the crisis that our community members are in, the folks who are at home with their kids, um, trying to navigate virtual learning, trying to maintain their own jobs, trying to feed their families. Um, a lot of people are really, really struggling much more than before the pandemic. So again, we're seeing um, an exacerbation of pre-existing inequalities and then we're seeing new issues emerge. So before we shift to the Q&A um, or just general discussion, I wanted to conclude with um, one quote from Josh Sabika. So this is from his uh, relatively recent book called Food Justice Now. And I think it, it just really encapsulates a lot of what we're talking about, that we see inequalities everywhere and we see them everywhere in the food system. There are currently over 20 million workers in the food system, most earning low or poverty wages and more likely than workers in other industries to be receiving social welfare, such as food stamps. In particular, people of color and women are more likely to earn lower wages and hold fewer management opportunities than their white and male counterparts. These food chain jobs are in some of the most dangerous industries in the United States, especially farming and food processing, which are overwhelmingly performed by a Latinx and undocumented workforce. So just thinking about what does this tell us about our food system, that the people that keep our food system running are the ones who can't afford to eat, or that they are at highest risk for COVID-19 because they're working um, in a meat packing building or they are a restaurant worker, just think, thinking about what this tells us about the interconnectedness of our food system and the stark inequalities in it. So again, to, to highlight one more time this, this narrative that I've been pushing all along, um, we call them systemic or structural issues because they are truly everywhere. So we can shine a light in any community in the United States and see these same dynamics play out, um, which can feel really overwhelming, but that also means that there are many, many entry points to address them. Um, and then also structural issues were built by people through policy and decision making. Um, and so they, they can be unbuilt by people too. Food deserts weren't a natural process. These things didn't just happen. Um, so what sort of decisions can we make in the future to address them? So I think Mary and Bill are also going to unmute now um, and we'll, yes. we'll have a Q&A and discussion. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was excellent. We do want to open it up now for questions and discussion. And as I mentioned, we're going to try something a little bit different here. Um, so everybody's mics 
have been locked. Um, and at some point we may just unlock those if this becomes too cumbersome. But what we wanted to try is if you have a question or a comment that you raise your hand and we will call on you or you can type in the chat and say, hey, I would like to talk. Uh, or you could type your question or comment in the chat. And so for those of you uh, who may be familiar with Zoom or not, um, I just learned recently that if you click down on the bottom where it says participants, it should open up a list of all the participants on this Zoom meeting. And there should be an option for you to raise your hand. And what I'm hoping is that those who raise their hand will kind of move to the top of the list of my participant uh, panel and we'll be able to call on you and you can speak your question or comment. And Mary, if you have a question for Sarah as we get started here, you can go ahead and ask or I have a question too. Actually, we just have a question or comment that came into the chat. So, um, and then I see somebody raise their hand. So let's do the chat and then we'll go to Lily in the, um, who raised their hand. So um, let me see here, things are jumping around now. So Sarah, cre creating changes, Travis asks, asks um, creating changes in this area are massive. Do you have any recommendations reaching out or speaking with others? I believe these issues are not real. I've not had much success with that. Yeah, that that is a hard question. Um, so I think that a blessing and a curse of being a college professor is that I get some students that are so on board and they are ready to change the world from the beginning. And then there are some that are a lot harder sell. And so I think in life, we always have to decide who is worth the energy. And so sometimes um, sinking a lot of energy into someone who is not willing to see the facts that are laid out right in front of us, um, that, that can be really draining for those of us trying to make change and not necessarily productive. So yeah, I, I'm trying to think if I have some really good specific answers about how to um, reach the unreachable I will continue to think about that question. Um, and also, I'm, I'm sure that in webinar two and three, we're going to get lots of answers. Uh, but yeah, I, I, if nothing else, I empathize with this challenge. And I'm going to continue to reflect on that. Um, so the, the question, I'm going to respond real quickly to the question about the increase. And then I'm going to actually um, try and, and access some of the links that I wanted to share. So I might stop sharing my screen and let Bill and Mary uh, facilitate a little bit of discussion so I can put some article links in the chat. Um, but the, the question about the 130% increase in food insecurity, that was national. That was data from Feeding America. Um, so they did acknowledge in that report that it's been very, very different by state based on the very different state responses um, to the pandemic. But that, that's where that data came from. And then, yeah, I'm, is it okay if I stop sharing my screen, Bill? Uh, yeah, that's fine. And I did want to go ahead and give Lily a chance to ask her question. She had her hand raised and then we'll get kind of back to the chat after that. So Thank Lily, you, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I thought that was a really great talk. Um, very powerful statistics. And I guess my question is, I think it's something like 95% of farmers and ranchers in the United States are white. And historically, the people who have actually been doing a lot of the agriculture have not been white. And so how do we like ethically try and redistribute the land to people who rightfully should be having it or should have more access to farming that don't have the resources to or don't have the leg in? So Sarah, um, do you want to jump in on that or do you want to? Mary, if you want to start, I'll put a few more links in and then I, I can respond too. So um, I think that this is a very, very difficult kind of question. And I think one of the things to remember is that 20% of, I think it's 
or is it 50%? The land, the acreage that is actually owned, um, uh, who owns land, a lot of it is by absentee landowners. So for instance, I am an absentee landowner, still in my family, but I am an absentee landowner. Um, so the question becomes, is are there ways to um, um, use tax policies, to use subsidy policies as a way to discourage uh, people from owning land as an investment rather than um, um, owning land as a um, to work the land. I mean, there could be some questions about that, I think. I think that might be, that may be a very radical solution, but it, it could be things that we could start to think about. Um, and I know that in the 90s already, the US Catholic Conference of Bishops said, you know, the people who work the land should own the land. And so there were real questions about land ownership in that in that sense. So I think we have to really dive deep into um, some of the um, intentional policies at the um, at the federal uh, level too around land ownership, and um, in order to start to address that. And I think the reverse thing is to um, you know provide uh, land linking, land transfer programs. Um, um, to support those, they're very underfunded. Um, and so if we could look, look at some policy changes there, I think that that could be helpful. The other thing is, is I want to point out that people like Monica White have done some really great research. Um, we'll hear a little bit more about this um, next time, but uh, around um, commons land ownership or um, communal land ownership. And I think that those are, you know, we we definitely need to make sure that the policies are there to open up those those possibilities. Yeah, Lily, I'll just follow up on what Mary was saying. Um, I I think that in terms of land ownership, ev everything that Mary explained about like the policy and the the tax explanations for this disparity uh, is really critically important to engage with, and then also. Um, thinking about this question. So, you know, my background is in agriculture education. There is a lot of focus on recruitment. And like, if we just recruited more people to be farmers or a more diverse group of people to participate in gardening or agriculture, that like that would solve our problem. But it wouldn't because we know that diversity is not the same as equity. Um, and also I think we have to be really honest about a lot of the stigma associated with agriculture for a number of reasons. I mean, if your ancestors were enslaved, perhaps you are not dying to be a farmer, or if your family um, are undocumented farm workers, that's not necessarily going to be seen through the same lens that a lot of us white people see, like moving back to the land. And so I think that it's important to recognize the structural economic reasons for these differences, but then also the cultural and social implications and really wrestling with this question, um, should everybody want to be a farmer? Do, do we want to encourage farming in populations um, that are not interested? And, and so that's another huge question with no clear answers, but I think something to be cognizant of because just recruiting more people into an inequitable system, that's not gonna fix our problems. So how do we, how do we tear down the issues of the system right now and rebuild a better one? Moving on to the next question that I see in the list, at least, uh, from Antoinette. What is being done to help decrease the large gap in wealth and food inequity between different races? That's a big question. Sarah or Mary, do you want to touch on that? <laughs> um, Mary, take it away. <laughs> I actually, I am not, I was just typing a note in the chat. We have so many knowledgeable people on here too. I know Neil Flores on here and some other folks that I can't even see. So if there are, if there are some ideas out there, I think it, it's not, by no means are Sarah, Bill and me the experts here. So um, I think that that's a, um, you know, a, a really great question. And I, um, the wealth gap, I think, I don't think we have a very good way of, um, of we haven't pursued policies to address that and I'm not sure exactly what all those policies would look like. 
So I've just given everybody the option to unmute themselves. If somebody would like to jump in on that question, you now have the power to. Yeah, I, I really would love to hear from some folks who have more concrete answers about initiatives. I think we've seen in this, what we've seen with the uh, relief for the uh, tariffs and even the derecho, which went through Iowa, is that the money somehow got in the hand of big landowners that are nowhere around. So I think a really important research activity for many of us would be figuring out what those rules are, because this is a trick. We're giving help to farmers. Which farmers? And clearly the people, the definition of policy is that norms and values of people in the community get turned into standards that turned into rules and regulations that are enforced. The problem is the people whose values are being turned into rules and regulations are the people who have the big money, the lobbyists, and the lawyers. And we've got to work on that. Jason, Thank you. Jason had his hand up. Um, Jason Ensmeyer. Sorry. Um, Bill, did you have somebody sure. else? Sure. Go ahead, Jason, and then we'll try to get through some of the chat questions after Jason. Yeah, so um, hi everyone, it's nice to see everyone again. Um, you know, something that I guess to sort of add, sorry, this isn't a question, it's more of a discussion topic, but it actually plays off of what Cornelia was saying. So something that I was thinking of, Sarah, as you were talking is, um, you know, you were really highlighting um, issues of race and ethnicity, um, but of course there are multiple other inequalities that we know about, especially when we're, we're talking about intersectionality which is sort of a buzzword these days, but right, gender plays a role in this, um, uh, gender identity and, and sexual orientation as well. Um, and sometimes I think in ways that we don't always uh, think of, I have some forthcoming research on local food systems and, and race and gender that actually sort of implies that maybe um, men of color are, are actually very disadvantaged because the experience of being a woman gives you some resources that you may not um, have as a, as a male to enter these kinds of food systems as an entrepreneur. Um, so there's really interesting, you know, ways that multiple marginalized identities overlap and either, you know, help or hinder each other and, and create this experience of intersectional identities. Um, I have colleagues in LGBTQ econ group for the American Economics Association that have been working on access to SNAP programs by LGBTQ and um, transgender persons. And, you know, of course, we see that transgender women of color are, are just almost incapable of accessing SNAP programs um, in, in a lot of kinds of contexts. And so sort of where this comes from also is, you know, what are the networks that we have around us and the informational resources we have around us um, that allow us to access things like these programs. So there's, there's sort of these multiple barriers of inequalities and marginalization, um, some of which are direct and some of which are indirect, um, simply because we lack certain, you know, resources that can help us uh, do things like fill out the paperwork and know that that certain programs are available for our farm um, because you know we're being excluded from these systems or we are operating in entrepreneurial networks that are very different so I don't know if others have sort of commentary on that but um, you know it was on my mind as you were talking Sarah you know highlighting this this central issue of race and then how we add these other intersectional marginalized identities onto that and how complex this the the picture becomes when we're trying to, to solve these policy issues. Yeah, thank you, Jason. I, I think it is really important to remember um, how, how differently we experience the world based on intersections of parts of our identities. And, and so, yeah, to, 
to boil it down um, into such a quick overview, I think that race is the most important thing to highlight sometimes, but race is not the only factor that shapes inequality in our, in our world. And um, yeah, there's been a, a quite a big body of research on how inequality is shaped by gender, but I agree the, the question of gender identity um, and sexual orientation, that's a pretty new frontier for food systems research. So it's very exciting to see what's coming out, but also it just complicates these questions even further, right? Because if we think we have a simple answer to any of these problems, um, we're reminded that there are no simple answers and that the food system just gets more and more complex. Another question in the chat relates to nutrition in prisons. And so um, in this particular question and comment, I have been interested in how nutrition in prison can negatively affect those being released and their ability to reenter society successfully. I'm thinking of micronutrient deficiencies rather than macronutrient. In other words, they may get the calories they need, but do they get solid nutrition? So are you aware of research that looks at this or So I, I'm pulling back through the chat. It looks like Karen asked that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Karen, Karen, I would love for you to email me because I have lots of resources about um, prison food systems specifically. But yeah, the so one of the classes that I'm teaching this semester on campus um, is about prisons and society. And so it's being team taught with two other people who work in our higher education and prison program. And so my third of the semester is all about food and agriculture in prison. So we're looking at the history of prison farms, um, the quality of food in prisons, and then also how folks who are incarcerated find ways to participate in food justice. Um, and so anyway, I think these are really, really interesting questions. And the simple straightforward answer is that the food in prison is terrible and the nutritional quality is poor. Um, and so again, this is another thing that really varies by state. Uh, things here in Florida tend to be particularly challenging. Um, so that's my context that I'm working with. But the thing that we see in, in prison food systems, we have the default rotating meals that are served in the chow hall that are designed according to a, an interpretation of the USDA guidelines that also determine our school food meal plans and things like that, um, but they are based on calories. And so we know that calories are not the same as nutrition or micronutrients. And so what happens is these um, alternate food systems that are occurring in prisons through things like buying commissary, like competitive foods, branded foods. And so those are not high quality foods either because it's mostly junk food, um, but the people that can afford those foods are people who have more money. And so anyway, we see a lot of like the microcosms of the, or we see a lot of the, the inequalities that we're describing in the food system at large play out in prisons too. Um, but I think that it is certainly a question of justice and you know, what are we claiming we can offer folks upon release um, if, if we are feeding them so poorly. Uh, so anyway, I would love to continue this conversation, and I, I was just excited to see that question. So thank you so much. Uh, Bill, um, would you like to tell everyone how we will share the links? Um, because there's been some great things like a Growing Cultures, uh, um, Hungry for, Hunger for Justice links, and lots of other links that Sarah uh, shared. So um, we are compiling them on our website, but I believe we'll share them other ways. Yeah, so we can put relevant links on the website and um, we can send out an email once things are sorted out after this webinar and let you folks know where those will be located. Uh, we'll also be posting the slides and the uh, recording of the presentation on our uh, inequalities in the food system webinar series homepage as well. So the idea is to compile as much of that material as we can and, and make that available to folks. We're coming up on 4.30, um, and I know I see there are a number of chats in the chat box. So um, 
we've got a couple of options. We can continue on. Sarah, I'm not sure if you were planning to hang around for what we're calling the social hour. Um, we can either, so Sarah, if you have the time, we can either go through a few more questions and if folks have to leave the meeting, um, then by all means you would have that ability to do so. But if you'd like to hang on, we could kind of just keep working through the chat and see where that takes us. So Sarah, what, what are your plans? Yeah, I'm, pl I'm planning to stay, um, but also okay. I really, I really loved Mary's idea of opening it up to um, some other attendees who probably have more specific expertise in response to some of these questions. So I would love to hear um, a larger discussion too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so should we just keep going with the Q&A? Yeah, why not? Okay. Uh, there is a pretty interesting question that I wasn't quite sure I understood. So I don't know if Tim, uh, Tim is still on. Tim, um, about I think, yeah, Tim has his hand raised. Tim, do you want to go ahead and speak your question or comment? Um, hi, uh, thank, first and foremost, thank you so much for this topic. It just adds so much more complexity. And uh, the nature of my question where it comes from is I'm currently interning at a small farm um, in mid-Missouri and it kind of, um, and with all the statistics mentioned about the inequalities with the farmlands, I didn't know if there was a relationship um, with um, the inequalities relating to lot size. I, I didn't know if a small farm would have an indirect or a direct relationship with inequality as compared to a larger farm. The, so you were asking about food insecurity rising along with the size of farms or about the... Um, yes, yes. I was uh, curious if it was, there was a relationship with the lot size and the increasing or decreasing um, food insecurity. So it's interesting because farmers themselves can be, I mean, especially a commodity farmer can experience food insecurity, as can other uh, farmers. So the people who grow our food can actually experience food insecurity. I don't know the data on that, um, but I, um, but it is a fact that that happens. So um, some of it has to do with um, the profitability of the farm, because a lot of farms are specialized in producing only certain kinds of, of products and may not have um, the basis for a, a, a wide dietary range. So there, there's a lot of complexities in that. So there's not really a clear, I can't just tell you that overall national food insecurity increases with um, the size of farms. I don't think that that's a, that's a, a thing that we can, we can even say, but that if you're thinking about individual farms, it's very complex how those, um, how that farm is organized and uh, um, the profitability does matter with those farms as well. Yeah, this is Andy Carlson. I'm at the Economic Research Service at mm -hmm. USDA. Now, I don't actually do food insecurity, although our new numbers were released this, uh, this earlier this week. Um, what I do know is, is that it's, it's really a relationship of income and at the margin, sort of how well you can manage your household and finances and what your medical bills look like and other expenses that the household has um, that you end up food insecure because food insecurity means you don't have the money to buy the types and types and quantities of food that you would like to buy. Um, and very low insecurity means that you're cutting your meals. So in terms of rural poverty, that may not necessarily be farm owners, although some are certainly, but that may be uh, unemployment is very high in rural areas and it may also be people who aren't necessarily farmers, but happen to live in a rural area. Yeah, actually, Andy, as you were, were talking, uh, you know, something that I was thinking to the heart of the question is really, it's about, is there a link between farm characteristics and food insecurity? And, and I don't even know if we have data sets that we could link that are measuring food insecurity with farm data, do we? I mean, most senses of ag products are focused on the 
production. And, and so we're not garnering household characteristics. And so, I mean, we're really talking about the way that we do research, right? We're, we're not really linking those kinds of data sets. I mean, maybe in some like theoretical sense, we could link household data with with farm data but but my guess is is that we would never be able to even do that i don't i don't know if that sounds yeah like i you. i again i don't know arms data right. i actually i actually work mostly with scanner data so right <laughs> right um, so i don't know um if you could put the if you could put the household food security um module into arms at some point to get it, um, and it would also depend on how much information is in the CPS mm -hmm. uh, or the CE data that has those modules mm -hmm. on, you know, what they own. I assume, I believe, the wealth is wealth measures are pretty basic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they uh, are. Mm -hmm. The questions are also in um, thinking. The questions are also in NHANES, but again, the wealth measures there are really basic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah wanted to mention a question in the chat from Liz Harrison. I see Liz, you're still hanging on. Uh, with COVID-19, many of us who work in this area in our public health food pantry, et cetera, partners are overwhelmed with COVID-19 related things. Who else in the community can we involve so that we don't lose traction on work that has been done before? And Liz, would you want to clarify a little bit on your, provide some clarification on your question and maybe mention this work, like prior work? Yeah, sorry, I was trying to come off mute. Um, I think the question is just that we, you know, from an extension perspective, we're providing education, we're trying to do some of that like policy and system based work, the environmental change work um, in our communities and kind of the roadblock that I keep running up against is that the schools that I was previously working with, the food pantries that I was previously working with, the health departments that I was previously working with are all um, kind of overwhelmed with COVID related tasks to the point where those conversations have just stalled out. Um, um, and so then there's, there's an inability to continue providing education um, in some cases and, and there's an inability to, um, to have those conversations to try and move this forward, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. That's a good question. I know there's a lot of folks with extension on this call who may be in a similar boat. Um, I've experienced some of that myself with uh, working with a variety of food pantries and um, really having to, to press pause on a lot of activities and initiatives and things like that and really even kind of think about, you know, with some of those groups, what might be some of their new needs and desires in this environment. So. Um, it may not be nutrition based interventions, for example, but uh, one of the programs that Mary mentioned, Power Up Your Pantry that I coordinate, we're getting ready to host a series of webinars on burnout for food pantry directors. So kind of thinking about what can we do to help them um, kind of keep themselves well during this very stressful time. I was, yeah, we're, oh, go ahead, Mary. Go ahead. I, well, I was get, curious. I was going to welcome Pam or Maria or uh, Sarah into asking some or answering some of that too from your perspective. But go ahead, Sarah Kramer. Yeah, well, I'll respond and then I would love to hear from other folks too. So um, I can say, Liz, here in Florida, I oversee a couple school garden projects. And so we've got some grants and we're working with public schools on um, school garden nutrition program and we collaborate with UF extension and and all of that is just totally stalled um, so I, I think it's hard because we don't know how long how, how temporary things are right now you know on the on the one hand it feels like a perfect time to be 
shifting and reimagining a better system, but also we're all just kind of in survival mode. And so teachers right now are not interested in working with me to garden with their students. They are trying to decide if they're going to be teaching virtually tomorrow or not. So um, I appreciated what Bill said about, you know, thinking about other needs that folks might have and, and addressing questions like, you know, how to handle burnout. Um, and then of course, bringing it back to the, the question of structural inequality, like different groups of people are able to manage the pandemic differently because of inequality. And so what other ways can we be um, directing our focus on addressing inequality and not just addressing food insecurity or gaps in nutrition, because we know that those are symptoms of the overall problem, which is people are poor and some people aren't. And so that that's really the root cause of all of these conversations that we're having. And so that's a much trickier question to address. Um, and, and one that folks are a lot more resistant because that's then a political question and, and a question about power. Um, but, but what we're seeing is, you know, symptoms of the larger issue. And yeah, that, that's the, that's the way I'm kind of reflecting on all this right now. But like Mary said, I would love to hear um, some more concrete examples from folks who, who are suggesting ways to maybe pivot your work right now. Uh, I can say a little bit on that. So right now, yes, COVID is what's taking over everything. And um, what I've been doing is using it as an opportunity to connect to people who will need our services down the road. And so in a way, like right now, we have a huge Hispanic population here in my area. And I, I mean, I work with some of them, but I would like to have more, um, to do more. So one of the things I'm trying to do is connect our, say, nutrition program associate with um, some of the Hispanic population here so they can sign up for SNAP, they, she can do that. So I'm translating that information to say, this is what you need to sign up. And if you call our office, we'll help you. And, uh, and then from there, we start bu building relationships with new people and um, also partnering with some other organizations that are offering free food like the YMCA. And just spreading out that information spreads out your name and makes you connect to people. So this is the time to connect and perhaps not necessarily to go and educate about all the things we usually do. But down the road, you will get back to that. I agree. I think to um, stay more connected with our communities, we're all involved with community coalitions and alliances and folks who are still getting together and trying to kind of keep their finger on the needs that are emerging and things are changing very quickly. But uh, when you've already been a part of that, make sure that you continue to be a, a, a very active part of that and uh, make sure that the dialogue is all about what the current needs are and how you can fit in and how you can do your part. And really that's a magic that happens when those community people get together and start talking about they know they're, they're, they're at the table, most of them. If they're not, they know the needs of their community. They know the resources that they can bring to the table. And magic happens. And so you don't have to have one bullet that works for every single community. It's really being engaged in your own community that makes things really happen. And so I know that here in Southwest, uh, there's a variety of, of alliances and collaborations that have been working uh, for years. And we shifted, completely shifted during this time. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in one of them is to focus on how we can help to, um, with funding for snap match at the farmer's market and how we can help the farmer's markets deal with that so that they can ensure that um, those who are, um, you know, needy can, can come and, and receive the, the benefits of the double up food bucks program that has, that is no longer. And, and some of the things in Christian County, we've developed a, a homeless alliance that the food pantries are at. And I know that the word homeless maybe doesn't really jive with, um, with what we're talking about, but actually a lot of the needs we're talking about do come to the table. It just has to do with what the needs are in our, in our community and how we can plug in and make sure that we're making, you know, we're, we're mitigating those needs and, and helping those folks out. With our nutrition educators, yeah, they can't do what they normally did. They can't go out and, 
and grab those folks and teach them face to face. But we figured out how we can maybe print out cards, maybe recipe cards or different things for the foods they are getting, how they can use those and put those in the bags that they're getting when they go through the drive through food pantry. There's different things you can do. You have to be creative. But I think if you're engaged and connected, you can continue to serve. I'm still tracking on some of these questions in the chat. Thank you very much for that discussion. Uh, Reagan asks, this is kind of a hefty question. Is the goal to level out class inequality among races or to abolish class inequality? I wanna hear Mary's answer to this question. <laughs> I was gonna say, what are your terms? <laughs> I think I think that inequality, class inequality, has to be addressed. I mean, and and uh, it's it's the intersectionality that we were talking about before. So that that you can't just address one one particular inequality because they are so interconnected and so interlinked. And so we have to do it all, um, at the same time, if possible, but still, you know work on what we can work on. I mean, don't be overwhelmed, but work on what we can work on. But I don't think that you can separate those two. And I think that um, likely Reagan, is Reagan still on? She might want to um, um, come in. But I, I think that, that like, basically from what I'm seeing from a growing culture, that's probably, um, that's their position as well. So Sarah? Yeah, I think the goal is to abolish it for sure. It, if, if it's leveled out across races, which is also so far-fetched, I can hardly imagine it. Um, but like Mary said, there's still been inequality. So there's still people with power and people without power. And so that hasn't really solved any of our problems. It's just shifted the, the mark on how we identify that. Um, but yeah, Reagan, do you, do you have thoughts on that question? That's a really, really interesting question. Um, I definitely think, you know, we're the solutions to abolish class inequality, I think um, it's the next step, you know, and I'm actually really surprised the question was addressed. I definitely um, was hoping people would reflect on it. So it's great to see that, you know, it's actually, um, people are thinking about this. I don't oh, have yeah. an answer on how, but you know. Mary's always thinking about this question, <laughs> how, how to abolish class inequality. <laughs> I was scrolling through the chat. I noticed that Reagan was plugging another webinar tomorrow. Um, that information is in the chat. Jeremy Malarski has a question. Has there been anything interesting in analysis of anti-hunger policies and their impact of late? But more simply, do we know what tools we have as a society that have been proven to be effective to address hunger? Bill, what is your, I would like to hear your take on that. Um, well, I mean, in terms of safety net programs, I think SNAP and food stamps have been shown to be highly effective, both in terms of addressing hunger and keeping a certain segment of people out of poverty and also stimulating the economy. You know, that money gets turned around and put into local economies uh, very quickly and, and very efficiently. So, and I know that there are, um, you know, criticisms and issues with SNAP, but um, in terms of helping to address an immediate need, that is one that I think is very effective. And SNAP, of course, was, you know, one of the great, um, um, great society programs that was uh, explicitly an anti-poverty program. However, cash transfers are also very, very helpful, right? And we need to think about because households can allocate their money in, in lots of different ways. So SNAP's a great program and it's great for a lot of reasons and it's really an important program that should be more enhanced in, um, um, in my opinion if we really want to address uh, uh, hunger. But also we know that cash transfers 
are extremely important as well because it allows families to um, allocate their resources um, how they need to allocate their resources. And I wish that our policy, um, our, our policy making in many ways in the United States is about the worthy. And that's, that's a problem because it does not trust people and households to make their own decisions. So universal basic income is, I think, one of the things that we should be talking about if we're going to address hunger issues. We've been scanning the chat further. There's lots of great discussion and comments and links in the chat. I'm kind of trying to pull out questions. Um, there's one from Andrea Berry. Are state-run prison systems worse or better than private contractors for nutrition and food quality? Is there any data on that? Yeah, I saw that question. Um, that's a really hard one because prison systems all vary so widely. So in, in the um, conversation around mass incarceration, we see a lot of folks focus on private prisons as like the problem. Um, and there are certainly problems with profiting from incarceration um, that directly. But uh, of course, there's lots of ways to profit from incarceration in more implicit ways. So anyway, th that's a long way of saying that there's not to my knowledge, there is not a direct link between quality because, um, for example, the prison where we work, they used to have an Aramark contract and so they were working with a for-profit company, but now their food service is handled internally, um, but they still are getting their weekly meal rotation uh, from the Department of Corrections. So I think that it, you know, in a state-run prison, there is perhaps more public oversight over those decisions. Um, but it's, it's definitely, there's a lot of variation in different contexts. I've scanned a little further down the line in the chat. Did you all see the comment and or discussion point from Elizabeth Berger? And related to obesity increases among non-white populations. I would like to have somebody, I am not, um, um, I, you know, this is not, this is not something in my bailiwick exactly. So I don't know, Pam or somebody else on the on the call. I think this is open to everybody. I don't I don't want to portray us as experts because um, we definitely are just learning with everybody. So, or Elizabeth, if you're comfortable, maybe restating your comment or question. All right, I'll restate it, but I'm not going on camera. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Um. My background, my PhD is in nutrition and um, exercise physiology. So I'm in a lot of the public health work is around, um, you know, the increasing rates of or prevalence of obesity. So I follow the CDC pretty closely and sort of amidst all the COVID stuff that comes our way every day. I noticed this quiet little new statistic of, hey, by the way, Yet again, we have an increase in obesity, more states, et cetera. And so I'm thinking to myself, and I'm sure there's many people on this call that are well-schooled in this literature of this um, very strong link between food insecurity and obesity, um, which is not only um, psychosocial, but also very interesting research now about how the stressors of living in poverty can actually affect you at the molecular level um, and your children so that you're, you're actually more prone to metabolize fat differently than someone who has not lived in a food insecure environment. Um, so I was wondering if anyone had thoughts on, you know, short-term versus long-term food insecurity and what that does 
and I just can't help but thinking, boy, if we have millions of people now that are going to go through six to 12 to 18 months of worrying about their next meal, what, what is this going to do to them three, five, even 10 years down the road, even when they have enough food about the choices they make based on what they've been through now? So that, I think, just muddied the waters even more. Nutrition specialists here, um, or nutrition experts, um, I think, I mean, I think these are really important questions that Elizabeth raises. And, you know, I think some of it would be addressed if we could, I mean, I think it's fascinating the, ex, the unemployment benefits that, um, you know, which were, they were still a flawed program, but at least it, it kept people afloat. And then after that ended, you know, then we've got the stress of evictions and all kinds of things like that. So, uh, um, you know, we're going to actually have a natural experiment again, too. But it looks like Pam's ready to answer something, too. Well, I was just going to say, um, you know, certainly food insecurity has been associated with, and I think Sarah mentioned this earlier in her presentation, an uptick in obesity and things. But but we also see really just in general, pretty profound effects on health outcomes in general uh, from food insecurity, especially in children. And so um, we see like birth defects, anemia, and cognitive problems, behavioral problems, and, and, and some pretty um, strong data, you know, with, with um, behavioral problems in children and, and learning and all that sort of thing. There's so many health outcomes that are associated with food insecurity. And so, um, yeah, the obesity piece is, is certainly there, but it just all comes from lower quality food or lack thereof of any kind of food, obviously. So I don't really know. It's just, it's just that what we've been seeing for years is now so exacerbated by COVID. And it's just so much more dramatic. And what we couldn't solve before, um, you know, <laughs> is just such a bigger problem now. So um, I guess I don't have a lot to say that's helpful because I think, you know, I would, I would have loved for us to get ahead of a lot of these problems before COVID hit because, you know, it, it seems almost insurmountable now in some ways, but we, we have to figure out ways to, to help mitigate these things. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking as we were talking about this question um, that none of, what has happened in terms of the food system or obesity, like none of these things are really that surprising to me because they were here before. And so we're just seeing exacerbated examples of problems and inequalities in the food system that were pre-existing. Um, but yeah, like, like you said, if we couldn't have figured it out in non-pandemic times, um, what, what options are we left with when we are when we're operating in a pandemic. So I, I empathize with the frustration um, and disappointment for sure. There's a question about how do we destigmatize the use of anti-poverty programs and the need for hunger relief? I have found many people in need not seeking help due to stigma. Bill, has Good this question. come up in your work in food pantries? Um, not directly. I mean, I don't know that we have kind of dealt with that question either through any of our research or intervention type activities. Um, I mean, I, I'm aware of the issue and I, I do hear about it some. Um, you know, I, I mean, I guess a couple of things come to mind if if we're talking about the emergency food sector, um, you know, I would think that food pantries could perhaps kind of reduce barriers to entry. And a lot of them have done that during COVID. So a lot of food pantries have moved more to a kind of drive through or curbside model. And they've reduced the amount of information that they 
require people to produce uh, to get food. So in some ways, that is potentially destigmatizing. Like if you know that you can just show up and receive help uh, without providing a ton of information, I think that's that's one way that can help. Um, and you know, before the pandemic, a lot of other pantries were moving more towards client choice models or incorporating more shopping. Um, so that I think in some ways that helps people feel more normal um, and less sort of called out, you know, if they're able to go and use a service that is more similar to using a grocery store and kind of less invasive, you know? So those are just a couple of ideas off the top of my head as it relates to emergency food. If we really want to go deep into that, though, I think that it's really about how we structure our policy, right? So, um, you know, in the United States, we have a long history. The first po um, policy programs, any kind of welfare programs in the United States were for the widows and children of the Grand Old Party, or i.e. the Union veterans. So they were deserving poor. And we're always talking about the deserving poor in everything we do in the United States, which is really ridiculous because it really separates us um, from actually addressing the problems. And so I remember Wayne, um, um, why my, uh, Wayne uh, Roberts from, um, Canada talking about how in, in, if food is a right, which you know we do not address in the United States, but if food is a right, then everybody's entitled to food. Universal basic income would help with an idea, with access for, for food, but we have to really think about food policies as um, for everyone, and that all of us uh, um, need food. So it should not be a stigma. Stigma. I mean, you can't have a policy that separates. Oh, these are for the. This is for the poor people. We should be saying we're guaranteeing access for food for everybody, and um, and that everybody can access it in the way that they want to access it. And I think we really have to get to a point in the United States where we think about policies in that broader sense, rather than saying this is for those who deserve it, or these are the deserving people that should be able to participate because it starts to become, that's how you start to develop these stigmas. And if, if it's a, you know, nobody's stigmatized for taking social security because we all participate in it and it's for everybody. So this is what we should do with food policy as well, in my opinion, because that would destigmatize it. Um, now that is really very fundamental. It's kind of like, you know, addressing class inequality. Um, it's a lot of work. But I think that moment is ripe for like asking these questions um, about, you know, how we should, how, you know, is healthcare for everyone? Is food for everyone? Is, is this what we want in our society? And I think the, the time to ask those questions right now is right now. Yeah, Mary, I, I think also just kind of returning to this framing of structural issues and the structural landscape. Um, like that, that is connected to stigma because we we believe that people should be making different choices, or that if we were in a in a position, if we fell on hard times, or if um, we lived in a place that was being subjected to food apartheid, that like we would probably choose the right thing. You, you know, it's just all of this kind of narrative that's such a myth that people have the same choices and that everyone has the same access to um, food options and social support systems and and all of these like safety nets and so I think that's why it's so useful to just remember that these structures were built around us and though we contribute to them um, we're not it, the the solution is not for individual poor people to shop differently or to ha get a grocery store in their neighborhood or something that it's so much bigger than that um and so i i just appreciate your call for us to really think about how we can use this moment to ask those much bigger questions because food is it's a symptom of all of these other issues in our society food inequality is not the freestanding problem it's the symptom
Good deal. Well, I think with that, we will conclude the Q&A portion of the webinar. We've gone over by 30 minutes, but I think it was very useful, um, kind of blending into the social hour here. So folks who would like to stick around, please feel free to hang on. I think some of us will be here until about 5.30. Um, I need to take a short break um, in between the Q&A and the social hour. Um, but again, the point with the social hour is to just have some conversation and hang out. I do want to thank Sarah so much for taking the time and for your insightful presentation. That was great. And I appreciate everybody who hung on and uh, everybody who's been on the, the webinar today for your attention and questions and comments. I think it's been a really educational and informative time. So thanks to everybody and feel free to hang around if you'd like to just visit. <laughs>